In part three, The Big Lie, Evolution or Delusion, we will be exposing a lot of lies that are very shocking with evidence that is indisputable. It will show how much the public has been lied to in the educational system about the age of the earth and so on. So we're going to begin continuing through with this flip book I have with links to the important information. So first of all, we'll go and open up that here again. And um, here we are. So there's 101 worldwide processes that reveal the Earth to be 6,000 to 12,000 years old, and they're based on far less presumptions <clears throat> than what is based upon for the dating of rocks and so on that evolutionists use. <clears throat> so, first of all, I'll go to this site here. Can science prove the age of the Earth? And here we have a list of 101 evidences for a young age of the Earth. Now, you know, some of the scientists, as I mentioned in the flip book here, um, these processes far outnumber the few processes used by evolutionists to assume long ages and are often far more sound and stable with fewer assumptions than the long age dating. Um, and I guess I can make this bigger. Than the long age dating used for the evolution model. With some young earth indicators, atheists point out contradictory evidence. But this is often based on greater assumptions on their part, which sometimes also contradict other aspects of their evolution long age model. So I want to show you some of those links now. I was about to show you here on this website here. <clears throat> we come down here and we'll just re read a few. The first one, DNA and ancient fossils. DNA extracted from the bacteria that are supposed to be 425 million years old brings into question that age because DNA cannot last more than thousands of years, <laughs> certainly not a million or more. So that's one point. Lazarus bacteria. Bacteria are revived from salt inclusions, supposedly 250 million years old, suggests the salt is not millions of years old. And it goes into more detail with that one. And we go on and on here. And there are many examples, but let's go down to a video here. Dinosaur blood cells, blood vessels, proteins, hemoglobin, osteocalcin, collagen, Histories and DNA are not consistent with their supposed more than 65 million year age, but make more sense if it remains only in the thousands of years old, because this stuff in dinosaur bones cannot la last longer than a few thousand years. Certainly not a million years. And here they're purporting 65 million years. Ah, that's, let's just take a look at this video. <coughs> In the early 90s, researchers from Montana State University made a startling discovery. Inspecting a piece of T-Rex bone under a microscope, they could hardly believe their eyes. They could see dinosaur red blood cells. This discovery prompted lead scientist Dr. Mary Schweitzer to say, it was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone. But of course I couldn't believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones after all are 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? In a Discover magazine article, Dr. Schweitzer explained further her surprise. If you take a blood sample and stick it on a shelf, you have nothing recognizable in about a week. So why would there be anything left in dinosaurs? Such a response is understandable, considering that she thinks dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. But surely such data suggests it wasn't that long ago. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, Creation. So there we go with that one. Now we continue on here to the next one. Ice cores do not in any way prove a long age for the Earth. 
but are based on many presumptions. So let's look at some of these presumptions. Here we go. Very, very convincing. Huh. A lot of people think that you can just count those layers in, in the ice core like we count tree rings. Is that true or not true? In the upper part of the core, you can count the layers. But when you get down further, where they've thinned so greatly, and there's such an incredible difficulty in interpreting all the various information, you cannot count them oh. as individual rings, particularly visually. And even the chemical compositions and the oxygen 18-16 ratios and so on, there's a tremendous controversy on that. So basically, you can estimate it for one uh, ice age, but it doesn't go back to hundreds of thousands of years, and you cannot count them as annual layers. There's too much difficulty in interpreting the record. So it seems we have some real differences in the assumptions associated with how we count uh, those layers. Well, if you had a uh, considerable amount of precipitation following the Genesis flood, you would have had a lot more precipitation than is normally assumed. Down in the middle of the core, things get so thin that you can't really interpret it correctly. The, the amplitude from the oxygen 18-16 ratios are almost impossible to interpret in terms of annual layers. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, these layers uh, can be easily interpreted as storm layers, not annual oh, layers. Oh. So that uh, if you assume that, say, you had a storm every three days, you would have 120 of those layers in one year not just one layer. And so uh, these interpretations are very inaccurate. And so you can't assume that in each individual layer is an annual layer. It's not hundreds of thousands of years. It could be just a few thousand years. You love this work, don't you? No, I've done it for years, yes. Uh, that's where I got into it. I and we won't go any further with that one. So there we have another example on ice cores. And why they are not any indication of long ages. It's based on a lot of presumption. Now, the evolution of life by the order of fossil layers contradicts an abundance of facts, and you will be amazed when you look at these videos to see how big those contradictions are. And I believe this is the one we want. Museums have some of the most amazing fossil collections in the world. These fossils are typically used to frame the idea of life slowly progressing over millions of years, rather than a worldwide catastrophe being the best explanation. Is this true? Is the fossil record really stacked in a way that proves life evolved on Earth over millions of unseen years? Or does the fossil record provide evidence that the world was covered by a massive flood in Noah's time just thousands of years ago? Actually, the fossil record does not show increasingly complex life emerging over the millennia. What it shows is a record of death in the order that the creatures were buried during the worldwide flood. Think about it for a minute. Genesis 7 verse 11 says that the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened, creating floods and tidal waves that were unimaginable. The Bible says the flood waters increased upon the earth for 150 days until all the high hills under heaven were covered with over 20 feet of water. This process successively buried all creatures outside the ark based on where they lived as the floodwaters prevailed, how smart they were, their means and speed of mobility, and their body density. This is precisely why the fossil record generally shows the shallow water marine creatures buried in the lower layers. Then, as the ocean waters rose higher and higher, the suffocated fish were buried, followed by amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and then birds. Dr. Carl Werner spent 17 years traveling to museums and dig sites around the globe, photographing thousands of original fossils and the actual fossil layers where they were found. His research revealed a lack of evidence for evolution theory, including no transitional fossils and clear evidence that shows animals have remained the same over the supposed millions of years of evolution. We went to the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. We filmed that the Smithsonian the American Museum of Natural History, we filmed at the Chicago Field Museum, all of the greatest museums of the world, basically, and photographed their fossil collections. Museum Victoria in Melbourne, the Natural Institute in Brussels, we filmed at the New Zealand Natural History Museum in Auckland, and the Red Path Museum in Montreal. 
Harvard Peabody Museum, the California Academy of Sciences, How many et cetera, places et cetera. We went to 60 museums, and Debbie took 60,000 photographs. Wow. At the dinosaur dig sites, we found examples from every major animal phyla living today, buried with the dinosaurs, and these animals look the same. Say that again, it's incredible. At the dinosaur sites, we found fossils, examples of modern animals from every major animal phyla, buried with the dinosaurs, and they look the same. You started out not knowing if there would be any. Zero. And then you found them in every group uh, uh, in the same strata with the dinosaurs. Yeah. And it, it's worse than that. Not only did we find this for animals, then for the plants, we found examples from every major plant division of plants living today, buried alongside the dinosaurs, fossilized, and they look the same as the modern plants. So you photograph fossils from dig sites and museums, and you realize that modern animals live with dinosaurs. That seems too simple. You know, Don, there is a rule in science called the rule of simplicity or parsimony or Oscom's razor that says the simplest explanation for a series of problems is usually the correct explanation. So yes, it is very simple. I love this phrase, simply profound. What you have found is profound by its simplicity that here are these animals that are just like they are today, and they were there then, therefore evolution didn't happen. According to the fossils that I look at, evolution did not occur. The plants look the same, the animals look the same. Sure, some of the animals went extinct, like dinosaurs, pterosaurs, but extinction is not evolution. The animal fauna has not changed. Look what he found about bats. Scientists have found over 1,000 fossil bats. Now, these, some of these fossils are beautifully preserved, full fossils of bats, even showing the wing membranes, the gut contents, etc. If evolution is true, you would expect to find not only bats, but a ground mammal similar to a mouse slowly changing over millions of years into a bat. There should be many, many steps. If you find a thousand bats, you would expect to find thousands and thousands of each of these steps. And how many have been found? Zero. No ancestors for bats. Aren't you Whoops. fed up oh, with paying for multiple separate Sorry solutions? One tool covers your... Wow. Over 1,000 bats in museums and not a single transitionary fossil leading to bats. They just show up, completely formed. Wouldn't you expect that after uncovering over 1,000 bats that at least a few pre-bats would be found? The same has been said by evolutionists for several other creatures. Leading dinosaur expert Dr. Weishampel wrote this about dinosaur ancestors. For my reading of the fossil record of dinosaurs, no direct ancestors have been discovered for any dinosaur species. Alas, my list of dinosaurian ancestors is an empty one. Wow, it's almost like a divine designer just put them here, all fully formed, just like the Bible says. Consider pterosaurs. Massive flying reptiles with wingspans sometimes over 40 feet that could likely only fly in the pre-flood world. Dr. Viol, curator of the famous Jura Museum in Germany said, Yes, I must say we know only little about the evolution of pterosaurs. The ancestors are not known. When the pterosaurs first appear in the geological record, they were completely uh, they were perfect, the perfect pterosaurs. After finding so many specimens in complete form, shouldn't some predecessors have been found by now? If museums have over 1,000 fossilized bats and many pterosaurs, why haven't they found any fossils that have been classified as pre-bats or pre-pterosaurs? Why are they always found in complete form? Where are the millions of transitional fossils that should exist if evolution theory is true? Why don't we see a reasonably smooth continuum among all living creatures, or in the fossil record, or both? 
Perhaps this explains why the evolutionary ideas about dinosaur ancestors keep changing, especially when they've now found dinosaurs even buried alongside their supposed ancestors. After Dr. Warner interviewed dozens of leading dinosaur experts from museums across the globe, he summarized his findings on this chart from the Chicago Field Museum. Note the counts of the different dinosaur varieties found. For example, 78 T. rex specimens. Think about it. If over 100,000 dinosaurs have been collected by museums and dinosaurs evolved from one type into another as theorized on the chart, shouldn't there be counts on the nodes of these supposed branches between dinosaur kinds? Instead, this chart demonstrates what we would expect if creation is true. The counts of the individual types of creatures found with zero transitions. It's also amazing when you look at the creatures on this chart that are supposedly evolving from the same branch, yet they are so obviously different, like Ankylosaurus and Triceratops. They've never... So you see, I don't need to go further, I think, on that one. It gives you the clarity that is needed as to the facts on those matters. And there's a lot more than just that. We continue on with this um, <clears throat> to the next video, I guess. We'll just go there, which is right here. From the University of Tennessee School of Medicine is going to talk to us about the National Geographic in November of 2004. Brad, why is that issue so important? The uh, the cover story of that particular issue was was Darwin wrong? And of course, you can imagine National Geographic, uh, not one to shy away from the topic of evolution, says no. The evidence for evolution, they say, is overwhelming. That's a pretty big no on the screen. Uh, yeah, that you like the small uh, font they yeah, use there. They are. They're making a point there, aren't they? They are. Now, what you're going to do for us on the show today is you're going to take this overwhelming evidence that they say they have, and you're going to take it point by point and refute their evidence. Piece by piece. In fact, they start out by saying that, that evolution is a theory that you can take to the bank. To the bank. They go on to say that the supporting evidence is abundant, various, ever-increasing, solidly interconnected, easily available in museums, popular books, textbooks, and a mountainous accumulation of peer-reviewed scientific studies. No one needs to and no one should accept evolution merely as a matter of faith. The first thing we, we probably ought to talk about is the author okay. of this particular study. A fellow by the name of David Quayman is the author. He apparently is the person who, who has the authority to tell us Darwin was not wrong. And he is that because he is a world famous scientist? No. Actually, if you'll notice on the, the screen, he did an interview for the Seattle Post Intelligencer reporter where he, he admitted, he said, I did my graduate work on William Faulkner. My training was all in literature, not biology, but when I couldn't make it as a fiction writer, and I would say... Brad, you're setting me up here. It's just, <laughs> you, you got to tell me. He made it as a fiction he writer. Did. He, he did. had to change genre a little. He couldn't write novels, but what, what we're going to get in these next few pages is some pretty interesting fiction. Yes. Yeah, so he, you know, basically, he ends up by saying, I get to talk to biologists, walk through rainforests, and see the world. And, and apparently, that qualifies him yeah. to tell us that Darwin was right. God bless the rainforest. <laughs> now, now, listen, you have a PhD from the Medical School of University of Tennessee. Yes, sir. And yet, you constantly have evolutionists tell you that you're not educated because you believe in creation. Yeah, that's, it's the whole intimidation of all intelligent people believe evolution. Right. All educated people believe. And yet we have a, a fiction writer who's used to write the story to prove that evolution's true. That's classic. Yes, it is. All right, now, we need to get on with this. You, you've got this evidence, though, one point at a time. The first thing is horse evolution. Horse evolution. Two terms we need to talk about very quickly. They basically represent the same creature, uh, Eohippus and Hyracothrium. And simply put, it's the creature that we see right here at the bottom of the screen. Uh, supposedly, this is the creature that all modern-day horses evolved from. 60 million years ago. The only problem with that is that beautiful little timeline is not real. Harold Nielsen commenting on this, he said, The family tree of the horse is beautiful and continuous only in the textbooks. In the reality provided by the results of research, it is put together from three parts, of which only the last can be described as including horses. The forms of the first part are just as much little horses as present-day daemons are horses. The construction of the horse is therefore a very artificial one, since it is put together from non-equivalent parts and cannot therefore be a continuous transformation series. Don, the point I want to make there is the year that that was written. 
1954. 1954. We already knew that this idea of horse evolution was imaginary all the way back in 1954, and yet November of 2004, National Geographic is marching this out as evidence. 50 Darwin's years right. later, they're still saying this is some of the best evidence we have in the world to prove the theory of evolution. That's right. Incredible. That's right. When they already knew it was wrong for 50 years. George Gaylord Simpson said the uniform, continuous transformation of hierocopterium into equius, so dear to the hearts of generations of textbook writers, never, never happened in nature. That's amazing. And ironically, because of that, some textbooks have actually dropped the horses, and now they're going to camels. Now, that's why is there any more evidence to use the same logic for camels than there was for horses? Simply put, we've disproven the horses so often that that they realize, hey, we've got caught, so to speak, so we're going to substitute. We're going to use a, a similar picture, because after all, that's what's teaching the kids, is this idea in that's their right. mind, this picture. Right. What I want you to notice, though, Don, is who the publisher of that particular textbook is. Uh, and that would be National Geographic. National Geographic. <laughs> so here we have the publisher of a textbook who has dropped the idea of horse evolution because they know they've, they've been caught in the past, and yet one of the first evidences they march out for us in November of 04. Is horse evolution. There's no integrity here. Absolutely not. It doesn't stop there. Number two, embryology. Uh, evolutionists would like us to believe that as a, a creature develops in the womb, whether it be a human or an animal, it goes through evolutionary steps. In fact, in their magazine, they say, Darwin wrote, the embryo is the animal in its less modified state, and that state reveals the structure of its progenitor. There's an there's assumption here beyond evolution. There's an assumption that the whole evolutionary uh, process happens in the womb. There's no evidence for that, is there? Absolutely not. Yet, on, on the screen, you'll notice a, a picture that is probably very familiar to a lot of the viewers out there. This one was, was drawn God, by a fellow by the glory. name of Ernst Haeckel. And basically put, these embryos, he would say, suggest evidence for evolution. I remember that from my eighth grade science textbook. Oh, it's, it's still very, very popular in textbooks. The way we read it, if you look down here at the bottom, this would be a, a fish, a salamander, a turtle, a chicken, a pig, a couple of mammals. And finally, over here at the end, we have a human at three different embryological states. His point being that early on, up here at this top row, he would say that all creatures, whether it be a fish, a salamander, a human, they were basically all the same. I mean, if you look across there, there's not a whole lot of difference. He, in fact, said that his turning point in his thinking was when he read Charles Darwin's book on the origin of species. And yet we know today Ernst Haeckel lied. He actually forged those images I just showed you. On, on this particular screen, you'll notice Haeckel's embryos are at the top, and the real picture is there at the bottom. In fact, Haeckel uh, was... Uh was disciplined as, as a uh, professor for lying, right? Yes, he was. In fact, uh, he, the, the story goes that he was kicked out of the University of Jena. You know, we've known literally for centuries now, he lied in his pictures, and yet they keep showing so, up. So who's the bigger liar, the man who drew the pictures in the first place knowing they weren't true, or the people who have continued to perpetuate the lie to our children when they knew it wasn't true? That's right. And even evolutionists admit it. And Natural History uh, magazine in the year 2000, Stephen Jay Gould, very well-known evolutionist, he commented on Ernst Haeckel's embryos. I want you to look at what he said. He said, we should therefore not be surprised that Haeckel's drawings entered the 19th century textbooks, but we do, I think, have the right to be both astonished and ashamed by the century of mindless recycling <laughs> <laughs> that has led to the persistence of these drawings in a large number, if not majority, of textbooks. I, I phrase, century of mindless recycling of lies. Yes. You know, we did a show, uh, another show on indoctrination, and it just says to me, you know, if you're looking for truth, you don't reproduce lies. Right. But if you're trying to perpetuate a theory for which you have no evidence, then you don't care if it's true. You just care if kids believe it. That's right. And that's what they're doing now. That's right. Sir Arthur Keith, in commenting on, on embryology, uh, he said it was expected that the embryo would recapitulate the features of its ancestors from the lowest to the highest forms in the animal kingdom. Now that the appearance of the embryo at all stages is known, the general feeling is one of disappointment. The human embryo at no stage is amplified in appearance. 
The embryo of the mammal never resembles the worm, the fish, or the reptile. Embryology provides no support whatsoever for the evolutionary hypothesis. If you look at the date when Sir Arthur Keith made this comment, it was 1932. Yes. We knew embryology provides no support whatsoever for evolutionary hypothesis. And yet, we're marching it out. years later, we're marching it's still it out. the best thing we got, and we know it's a lie. Isn't that incredible? And you ask yourselves, are we, are we still putting it in textbooks? Definitely. That's absolutely damning evidence. My guest, Brad Harrow, who is a PhD. Uh, that's that one. <clears throat> and we go on here. I don't know if I need to go back to the book, but we will just continue with this here. <clears throat> and we'll continue on with just the next videos. And here it is. At the Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas, we have actual original artifacts that challenge evolutionary theory. One of the more intriguing of those artifacts is the London artifact, a hammer. This hammer was discovered in June 1936, at the time of this taping, that is 76 years ago. It is in rock, hard concretionary rock, that is assigned an age of 140 million years. And it's in an area that's assigned an age of 300 million years, a broad area. But there's a small area assigned an age of 140 million years. So let's just take the younger age. Now remember, those ages are simply assigned due to the artifacts that are found in them and particularly the fossils that are found in them. This hammer was discovered in June 1936 by Frank and Emma Hahn. Their son later became a professor at Ohio State University. We were able, with the help of benefactors, to purchase this some years ago. When they first discovered it on a piece of new property they had just purchased, they simply saw a rock, concretionary rock, that was embedded in the bedrock. They got it out. It was nothing but a stick sticking out. Their son chipped the top of it off. This is a portion of the overlay material. You can see the groove where it fit. Now, the overlay material covered all of it. This overlay material consists of nucleopolysopod shells which are assigned an age from Silurian to present. And again, that is of no great significance, but the hammer itself is. A portion of the handle is colified, indicating that there was pressure and compression. There's no rust on it. This is char. I took this particular artifact to Battelle Laboratory in Columbus, Ohio. We used the same laboratory, the same instrument, the same technician, to analyze this as analyze the original moonstones that were retrieved by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. In the research at the laboratory, they did a streaming microprobe elemental analysis, and they discovered that the iron, the hammerhead, is 96.6% iron, 0.74% sulfur, and 2.6% chlorine. You can't do that. You can compound chlorine with dust particles of iron, but not with a lattice of iron. Whoever fabricated this instrument had knowledge superior to our best physicists of the day. But I think one of the more intriguing facts about it is this little area that shines bright is where the son of Frank and Emma Hahn when he first removed the overlay material, took a file, seared down through it to see what it was made of. It was 76 years ago, and where he filed, it is not rusted in 76 years. I received a call from the lab at a major university, and the spokesman said, we've just watched a documentary that you released on the hammer, the London artifact. And in our opinion, it is a genuine pre-flood artifact, he said. 
I said, how do you know? He said, because where it was seared, if it does not rust, that means there's iron oxide FeO on it. He said, you see the brown char, that's iron oxide FeO, Fe203 or Fe304, which is a dirty brown. And he said, that's because of the radicalization of ultraviolet radiation. He said, in the pre-flood atmosphere, most of that ultraviolet radiation was filtered out. And in the laboratory, we can generate straight FeO by removing most of the ultraviolet radiation and increasing the humidity slightly. And he said, the FeO forms on the surface of the iron and it remains permanently bright like silver. I think perhaps he has a point. This certainly appears to be a genuine pre-flood artifact. Either way, finding this artifact in rock that is assigned an age of 140 million years not only challenges evolutionary theory, not only disrupts evolutionary theory, but it devastates evolutionary theory. So there you have it on that one. <clears throat> and we continue with the next video. Brief episodes, we've been examining actual original artifacts that defy evolutionary theory. At the Creation Evidence Museum, we've accepted the challenge offered by some of the leading spokesmen of evolutionary dogma of our generation. For instance, Professor David H. Milne of Evergreen State College, Olympia, Washington, and Professor Stephen D. Schaefersman of the Department of Geology, Rice University, Houston, Texas, admitting in writing that if we could find human and dinosaur footprints in the same rock layer, such an occurrence, if verified, would seriously disrupt conventional interpretations of biological and geological history and would support the doctrines of creationism and catastrophism. Notice they gave biological and geological history a positive account and gave creation and catastrophe an ism account. However, if we could accept their challenge, meet their challenge, and defy evolutionary theory, we remove the ism from creation and the ism from catastrophism. Well, Professor A. E. Wildersmith, who had five earned PhDs, carried the implications even further. One authentic man track found in the same stratum as one authentic brontosaurus or dinosaur tract throws out 100 years of evolutionary teachings. It is sufficient to bring the whole Darwinistic theory down and revolutionize all biology today. Is it possible to do so? We've examined actual artifacts beginning in the Cambrian that is assigned an age of 550 million to six. 150 million years in age, but we have a human footprint, a sandal print in that lower area, meaning that the entire geologic column evolutionarily assumed to be 650 million years of progressive evolution was actually a demonstration of the sedimentary deposits during the worldwide flood approximately 4,500 years ago. <clears throat> so we've examined evidence at the bottom man was present. We found a cup in coal. We have those actual artifacts. That coal supposedly 395 million years in age, but it has to be recent. All of this has to be recent. But central to the issue is the Glen Rose controversy, the Paluxy controversy, that man and dinosaur lived contemporaneously. Tracks were found before the Depression. And during the 1930s, one enterprising individual, because there were footprints of dinosaurs and footprints of human beings found in the Biloxi Basin, actually carved a few of both. Therefore, when we examine human footprints among the dinosaur footprints, evolutionists say everyone knows the human footprints were carved and they hang up the telephone. Not so quickly. In 2000, July of 2000, Alvis Delk, 
a an amateur paleontologist, amateur archaeologist, discovered in the vicinity of our excavations a human footprint, all five digits, distinctively human, having been invaded by an Acrocanthosaurus dinosaur footprint, who stepped on, pushed forward, and actually moved some of the consolidated mud under the human footprint forward into the print itself. So not only do we have in the same rock stratum dinosaur footprints and human footprints, in the same rock itself, this is the actual, original, authentic print, a man-made print and a dinosaur print. Spiral CAT scan technology has been applied. The compression is very distinct under, around, and ahead of each of these prints. Thus, we've accepted the challenge. Thus, we've demonstrated that man and dinosaur did live contemporaneously. This removes the ism from catastrophism and the ism from creationism and leaves the absolute truth of creation by the hand of God himself and catastrophe during a worldwide flood. These are actual original artifacts that defy evolution and support creation. And so we see again what's going on here. We go to the next one. In Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas, we have a group of artifacts, very specific original artifacts, that seriously challenge evolutionary theory. In fact, we have more artifacts in place here than we know of as a composite anywhere else in the world. Evolutionary theory is diagrammed as a geologic column. This is a representation of the geologic column that we have erected at the Creation Evidence Museum, and we have the actual rock in place from various parts of the United States. According to evolutionary theory, about 650 million years ago in the Cambrian, life began to explode or develop. And progressively, that life evolved over a long period of time through the Carboniferous era, through the Permian, and through each era of the Paleozoic, the dim distant past, then the middle or Mesozoic dinosaur eras, divided into Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, and then the Cenozoic recent times. And according to evolutionary theory, we have a slow development of living systems over 650 million years, culminating with the appearance of man. But at the Creation Evidence Museum, we have actual original artifacts that seriously challenge, disrupt, and falsify the evolutionary theory. For instance, we have the original O.W. Willett print. A Cretaceous rock, a series of six prints were found in the mid-1950s, and here we have a pterodactyl print laterally, and we have that being stepped on by a human footprint 11 and a half inches in length. In addition to that, from the Permian, we have a large human footprint. The question is, are these genuine? Spiral CAT scan technique has been used on all of these artifacts, demonstrating that through the rock, the signals that we receive show compression density and show the movement of the foot. These are genuine. From the rock that is assigned an age, according to evolutionary theory, of 110 million years, to rock that is assigned an age 225 million years, and then we have the Meister print, an original sandal print, in the Cambrian rock that, according to evolution, is assigned an age of 650 million years. It is a human sandal print with wear on the heel, stitching around the side, trilobite pressed into the toe area, and the overlay material shows a trilobite compressed as well. In addition to that, we have a human hand print from Palo Pinto County in rock that is assigned an age of 110 million years. We have the recorded thumb print and the recorded print of the finger and fingernail and the thumbnail as well in the rock 
that harden from the mud. In addition to that, from the Carboniferous period, from the time of uh, the coal, we have this cup that, according to evolutionary theory, is in material that's supposed to be 400 million years old. In addition to that, we have the iron hammer, the London artifact from London, Texas, in rock that's supposed to be 110 million years old. All of this is symbolized by the icon of the museum, which is the delt print, an 11 and a half inch human footprint being intruded by an Acrocanthosaurus dinosaur footprint. We have the spiral CAT scans demonstrating that the human footprint is genuine and the dinosaur footprint is genuine. How does this disrupt evolutionary theory? According to the theory of evolution, this era in which we're working, the uh, Cretaceous period in the Mesozoic era is assigned an age from 64 million down to 140 million years ago. But here we have man, who according to evolution appeared at the top, along with dinosaur, along with coal material, along with the Meister print. What we have actually demonstrated is in these sedimentary deposits, there's evidence of human fossil remain or artifacts left by human beings throughout the geologic column. The geologic column then does not represent a long series of evolutionary progression, but represents episodes during a worldwide flood. At the Creation Evidence Museum, we have actual original artifacts that seriously challenge and seriously disrupt evolutionary theory. There we go again. And we may as well progress along with all of this. It is very encouraging to examine actual original artifacts that demonstrate that we arrived by creation, that we owe allegiance to a creator, that there's a purpose in life and a possibility of a bright future. As opposed to evolutionary theory, assuming we arrived from a chaotic past, have no certain purpose in this life, and have a very questionable future. One of the more intriguing and gratifying of these original artifacts owned by the Creation Evidence Museum is a little finger. This is an original finger having been discovered by a little lady in the same rock layers as the dinosaur footprints are found in the Paluxy River Basin. This particular finger has been analyzed, first of all, by spiral CAT scans. It's been demonstrated to be genuine. That is, we have the distal, the medial, and the proximal joints showing with spiral CAT scan. We have the actual bone being read by spiral CAT scan. We have the actual cartilaginous ligaments being read by spiral CAT scan. But that isn't all. We have the fingernail and the cuticle and the taper read by spiral CAT scan. And one of the more intriguing things, it is, it is slightly compressed. For those of us who actually work in the fossil record, we find that all fossils are slightly distorted. You never find a perfect fossil, which means that the fossilization process requires an immediate coverage so that bacterial decay will not occur. This has to be completely covered. More pressure is added to that, and while it is still pliable, slight distortion occurs. The head of the entire science department at a recognized university was able to determine that this was the fourth finger on the left hand of a girl, the ring finger, a young lady. This was found in the same layer with the dinosaur remains. What does this do for evolutionary theory? Professors Milne and Schaefersman admitted in Journal of Geological Education that if we could prove that man and dinosaur lived contemporaneously, that would actually bring into serious jeopardy the standard interpretation of the biological and geological history and strongly favor creation and catastrophe. Well, sure enough, a little girl proved that and thus demonstrated the truth 
of the biblical record. We did not arrive by evolutionary process. We arrived by the hand of creation. And there we have it with that one. And we're going to just continue on with these. Series of episodes. We are examining actual original artifacts at the Creation Evidence Museum in Glen Rose, Texas. Artifacts that challenge evolutionary theory. We've seen that leading spokesmen for the evolutionary movement have said if you find man and dinosaur living contemporaneously, that'll destroy evolutionary theory. Dr. Ernst Mayer challenged Dr. Duane Gish in a live debate by saying, why, if your friends could find man and dinosaur living contemporaneously, that would blow evolution out of the waters. And then the challenge was further made that if it could be proved that something like a complicated mammal, perhaps a horse, could be found in rock assigned 500 million years in age, that would completely destroy evolutionary theory. Now remember those ages are simply assigned. You can get essentially any age you want out of any rock, just run a different type test. But the rocks are assigned ages assuming evolution to have occurred. What? Find a complicated mammal like a horse in rock that's supposed to be 500 million years old? Let's do better than that. Here we have the Meister print. The Meister print is found in very hard slate among trilobites, assigned an age, according to evolutionary interpretation, assigned an age of 650 million years in the Cambrian. But amazingly, this artifact has a trilobite, an Arathia gingai trilobite, here in the footprint, and the overlay material that was pulled off also has another Arathia gingai trilobite. What is this artifact? It is a human sandal print with wear on the outside and the back of the heel, stitching around the side on both sides, the curvature at the front of the sandal print terminating about an inch and a quarter before the end of this very, very hard Cambrian slate rock. Actually, this was made by a human being, and it's at the bottom of the geologic column. Not only the sandal print was made by a human being, but in addition to that, the print was made by a human being, stepping on at least two Arathia gingai trilobites. This establishes that man was present at the bottom of the geologic column, but for evolution to have any plausibility at all, man has to develop at the top of the geologic column in recent times. Here we have proof in sedimentary rock on a worldwide scale that the entire history of the biota of living systems does not demonstrate evolutionary development, but instead demonstrates Episodes in a world-wide flood. And at the bottom of the column, man was present. The so that's about all you need to know there, isn't it? And so we go to the last video here. Watch this. David Bassett writes that to the credit of the academic community, the true identity of Hesperopithecus Harold Cookii was first released in a one and a half page article by William K. Gregory entitled Hesperopithecus Apparently Not an Ape Nor a Man in the prestigious journal Science, volume 66, number 1720, on December 16, 1927. This was followed by editorials and headlines in major newspapers such as the London Times and the New York Times. The latter even put the news of Nebraska man's demotion on the front page. Afterward, the British journal Nature printed on January 28, 1928, a 16-line paragraph on Hesperopithecus downfall, albeit in the back pages. So there was release, but the damage had already been done. And as a, stay tuned, I want to show you in the published journals. Now, what's the name of that guy? What's the technical name of the Nebraska man? Help me out. Now, you're, you're a technician. What's uh, has, Hesperopithecus Harold Cookii. Okay, watch this. A technical disclaimer relating to the Nebraska man as being in the human lineage was issued. However, the mass propaganda served to 
build a mindset of man descending from lower life form. It served its evolutionary purpose. Now, here is a very popular publication. Look at it very closely, of course. There is at the bottom Ramapithecus, who has in the last 20 years been demoted to just being another ape. Australopithecus, just another ape, but Lucy is included in that. Homo habilis, Homo habilis, that's just a catch-all for a bunch of fragments throwing human bones, ancient human bones, and uh, uh, lower primate bones all together. There is no skeleton involved. Sinoanthropus, and all they had was the report of some skulls in China. Nothing but a report. All the originals are gone. They were supposedly transferred to Germany. The originals are gone. There's no evidence. Yet, here they're publishing all of these in our descent. Pithecanthropus, Pithecanthropus erectus was the Java man, turned out to also be uh, the skull was the kneecap of an elephant. But that's officially, you need to come for every one of the lectures this year and get all the facts. Hesperopithecus, I've heard of him. There he is walking quite upright. Who's Hesperopithecus? Nebraska man. What is he really? That's the tallest pig I've ever seen. Well, maybe that's a feral hog. All they had was one tooth, and they formed a skull That's and everything. That's the funniest looking it. pig. And later on, it was found that. out the tooth was from an extinct That's pig. just a, an ape face on a human body, a little long on the arms. Hesper, the guy was a pig. You know what I'm, Talking do you understand what I'm saying? We need the facts. The facts are not being presented. There is an agenda to uh, disturb the human mind, cloud our past, and discredit the word of God. That's what Charles, old Charlie boy, intended to do. He, he said, I feel like I've murdered God, and he was proud of it. He literally wrote that he had murdered God. Oh. So there's Hesperopithecus. Next to him... Doug, can you read that guy? The one who's between Hesperopithecus, the pig man, mm -hmm. and the Neanderthal, smarter than we are. Who's the guy in between? Eanthropus. Uh, anybody ever hear of Eanthropus? Who was Eanthropus? His, uh, yeah, the, yeah, right. Piltdown Eanthropus Dawsoni, the Piltdown man, a total fraud known since 1953, and yet this charade parade Still pushing this, the crap. is being carried in a lot of publications worldwide. You see it's stickers oh, like that on cars. On. How Something sick. fishy in Denmark. Total fable. No facts at all. Absolutely complete lies. So there again we see the evidence <laughs> being exposed of all the lies. So now we're going to continue after the part four, and this will be the end of this section, um, going to a new section that will be on archaeology. So I'll just shut this down now pretty quick. Um, so thank you for looking at this and looking at evidence, the clear facts that are irrefutable, that expose a big lie, pretty obvious. People want to believe a lie and try to make excuses around all this. You know what a delusion they're living in. It's complete delusion. So thank you for watching this video.